In this episode, we're going to deal with F.W. de Klerk and South Africa's international relations. F.W. de Klerk, almost from the moment you became leader of the National Party in February 1989, you started to think about South Africa's position in the international community. You embarked on foreign visits, and not only before you became president, but after you became president, you visited virtually every corner of the world. What was your goal? What was your objective? I had two goals. The one is South Africa's economy was in a bad shape. It was necessary to get sanctions lifted. My second goal, which I deem even more important, I wanted to restore South Africa's image in the world. I needed, I thought, I predicted in my mind to myself that I would need at times even pressure from the international community on the ANC in the negotiation process. I needed my initiatives to get the support of the leading countries of the world so that I could rely on that support in tough times. Now in this, you were greatly uh, assisted by the veteran foreign minister, Puk Boerte. Uh, Puk Boerte, I think, was one of the longest serving foreign ministers in the world at that time. What role did he play and what was your relationship? Puk Boerte was a very brilliant man and he played a wonderful role. He was a good foreign minister. He had a way of getting through where other people couldn't get through. And he played a crucial role in setting up these visits. Some of them were his initiative. He would come to me and say, I think you must visit so and so and so and so. So we worked very closely together, especially on this. I liked him as a person. He was a volatile man. Uh, I also at times was afraid that he would go too far, that he would in a, in a careless moment say things he shouldn't say. He had a reputation for that. But nonetheless, I wouldn't have gone into the international campaign, which I embarked on without him at my side. South Africa's domestic situation was also intimately affected by what was happening in Namibia and Angola. And uh, at the end of 1987, after the defeat of the Angolans and the Cubans at the Battle of the Lombo River, Gorbachev pulled the plug on Soviet involvement in Angola. I think that he was more interested in perestroika and glasnost. This was a very expensive effort. And he then told the Cubans and the Angolans that they would have to reach an agreement with South Africa. And in 1988, they concluded the, the uh, trilateral agreement in terms of which uh, Cuban forces would be withdrawn from Angola and the UN independence plan would be implemented in Namibia. How important were these developments for what subsequently happened in South Africa itself? I believe it played a very important role. Fact is, it was evidence of the implosion of the Soviet Union, which came to a high point with the coming down of the Berlin Wall. It was also a pointer towards what negotiation can achieve. In one stroke with that agreement, we got rid of the communist threat. It lost its teeth. In one stroke, we got rid of the, of the presence of a major military force from another country, which was really waging the war. It wasn't so much Swapo as it was the Cubans. And thirdly, it showed to us in South Africa 
that negotiation can achieve much. So it was of significant importance to our efforts to get negotiation going in South Africa. And then, of course, the, the cherry on the cake was the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989. Because one of the central concerns of the South African government had always been the influence of the SACP within the ANC alliance, and then the huge support that the alliance received from the Soviet Union and its allies. So how did that affect your thinking at that time and the timing of the process that, uh, that you were about to introduce? I couldn't have made the speech I made on the 2nd of February 1990 if the Berlin Wall didn't come down. For too many decades we've been fighting communism. There has been a very real communist threat against South Africa. Russia, the Soviet Union, had an expansionist policy in Southern Africa. They wanted to directly or indirectly control the whole of Southern Africa. And on that basis, with the ANC as their intimate partners, could not have been unbanned. They would remain an instrument in the hands of the Soviet Union. But with the Berlin Wall coming down, with the end of the Soviet Union, that threat fall away. And with that threat out of the way, I could take the courageous steps which we took on the 2nd of February 1990. Now, one of the first big breakthroughs in South Africa's inter, uh, international relations was your visit to Washington in September 1990, when you met with President Bush. And it was, it was a remarkable experience for South Africans because instead of arriving in an atmosphere of hostility, there were South African flags flying in the streets. You were received with all due honors. You went to Arlington National Cemetery. What did that feel like? And, and what was your impression of George uh, Bush Sr.? Well, I was surprised by the warmth of the reception. America was, in a sense, at the forefront of fighting apartheid. Its laws regarding sanctions were some of the strictest in the whole world. I expected what I also encountered in other countries, still organized groups, uh, protesting against my presence, calling me and the South African names, etc., etc. It didn't happen. So I was touched by the warm reception. George Bush, I immediately liked. He said he was a good man. And he was an honest man. He was a man of integrity. And from the beginning, he was supportive of the initiatives I told him in much more detail about. He had to, in terms of American law, certify, in a cert to a certain extent, certify is the right word, that the process of fundamental change in South Africa has become irreversible. That would be the key to open the door to bring to an end the sanctions that America has imposed on us. And my task, the purpose of this visit, was to convince him that he can honestly and openly and with integrity say the process in South Africa has become irreversible. So my negotiations with him, my talks with him, he listened attentively, was all focused on that. And he said it. Then he said it on the lawn outside the White House. I was, 
I was so touched and thrilled that if I remember correctly, I forgot my watch on the podium from which I spoke. And he picked it up and ran to the car and knocked on the window and gave me my watch. No, he was a good man. And in the uh, uh, subsequent years and months, you visited the United Kingdom on several occasions and you had meetings with Margaret Thatcher's successor, John Major. What was your relationship with John Major like and, and did he continue to give the support that Margaret Thatcher had given to the process? John Major, like George Bush, is a good man. Also a man of integrity. He had more the approach of an accountant when we first met. He had beneath the table, we had dinner in at Downing Street 10. It was just me and you and him and one advisor. I can't remember whom it was. And it was as if he was looking at a little checklist. Uh, under under the tablecloth and he asked the regular usual questions and when we finished with that I said now that we've done the major part of the agenda let's really talk and he opened himself up and he became a stern supporter of our initiatives and supported me throughout the rest of his and our careers together without any punction. He was supportive and supported me as well as Maggie Thatcher did. Uh, and your travels also took you to Moscow. The Moscow which had been the capital of the Soviet Union, the chief uh, enemy and threat to South Africa. And there you were received with full honors by President Boris Yeltsin. What was that experience like? What was it like for a South African president to find himself in the Kremlin? It was my eyes goggle. For when our little group walked in the Red Square, I became very emotional. I didn't expect such a warm welcome. I expected a dysfunctional Boris Yeltsin, which wasn't the case. When we had our one-on-one, -on -one, he was asking pertinent questions and he was quite on the ball. But he was broadly supportive and uh, I appreciated his openness and his attitude to be supportive of fundamental change in South Africa. Now, were you, in retrospect, satisfied with the progress that you made in these international visits? Did you feel that the international community responded positively enough to what was happening in South Africa? And do you think that you achieved your goals with all of these meetings? Definitely. I felt it was worthwhile. We have achieved a lot. The world's attitude regarding South Africa has changed. There was pressure on the international community from the ANC not to lift sanctions. They said that must wait until the changes take place. And against that pressure, in many, many countries, the sanctions were lifted. So it was actually a great success. Now, on the 24th of March, uh, 1993, you made an announcement that you would be addressing the South African Parliament on an important issue. None of the journalists guessed what the issue would be. When you stood up in Parliament, you announced that South Africa had had nuclear weapons. You'd six and a half nuclear bombs had been made, but you had taken the decision soon after becoming president to dismantle this nuclear capability. 
so that South Africa could join the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now, why did you do that? Why did South Africa develop these weapons in the first place? And then why did you take this decision to dismantle this capability? The decision to make nuclear weapons was taken before I became a member of the cabinet. It was taken by John Foster. It was regarded as necessary at that stage because of South Africa's growing isolation, because of the growing military threat against South Africa, also vis-à-vis -vis the Cubans, and because we, or the powers that be then realized that in a crunch, we would not be able to rely on military support from any other source. So it was never intended to build a bomb that would be used. The intention was, that's how it's been explained to me, it was from the beginning meant to be used as a deterrent. And therefore, the rumors that we might be building it, that we might be involved in it, suited us. The existence of this project was on a strictly need-to-know basis. The cabinet didn't know about it. Only a few ministers, through their line functions, was aware of it. Obviously, P.W. Boota was aware of it when I became a minister, and obviously the top staff of the Defence Force knew about it, and obviously the scientists working on it knew about it. So I was then in one, at one stage of my career as a minister, made Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs, which necessitated me being briefed on this project, because it was manufactured at premises controlled by my department. It was using enriched uranium made by UCOR, which fell under my department. The whole atom, peaceful atom use, fell under my department. So, I was briefed. I was shocked when I heard about it. I never liked the idea. I thought that this rumor that we are, that we have nuclear weapons was a negative factor in our fight against growing isolation. And I could not foresaw that we would ever use this and it was a great expenditure. But it was too late for me to stop it. Already, I think when I first became aware of it, Four have been completed and they were working on the rest, if not more than four. So, I managed it until I was shifted to another portfolio. I then lost touch with it. Uh, and then I became president. And always at the back of my mind, I had the aspiration to do something about this if ever I become president. So one of the first things I did was to call this group who knew about it together and to say to them, I think we should sign the non-proliferation agreement. We should get rid of the bombs and we should become part of the international community on this issue. Some were shocked, but in the end, I had to put some pressure. The ministers involved acceded to my suggestion that we should dismantle these weapons. That's the order in which it had to be done. You must first dismantle and then invite the international organization, IAAE or something like that, I can't remember the exact initials, 
to come and inspect and to give us a clean certificate that we are clean of nuclear weapons. So I also had the support of Vainant de Villiers, who was head of the Atomic Energy Agency, uh, who is a good man, and uh, he had to administer this, but he also didn't like it. I think the people in the Defense Force were very shocked, but they couldn't overturn the decision. So we dismantled it. I appointed Professor Vainant Moton, a former vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, who was aptly qualified in science to act as sort of the overseer of this process. And he had to report directly to me that everything was done, that nothing was hidden, that everything was done to the extent that we would be totally rid of this capacity and that we would be able to account fully to the international authorities. We achieved that and then I could announce that we're signing the non-proliferation agreement. It was a proud moment for me. Mr. Mandela didn't like it, that I did it on my own. Uh, but I did it, and I believe it was the right thing, and it did serve the purpose of further convincing the rest of the international community that we are bona fide and that they should not question our integrity on our commitment to bring about fundamental constitutional change in South Africa. And in doing this, you became the only leader ever of a country that had developed nuclear weapons to dismantle them. Why do you think that is? Why, do, why does the rest of the world keep these weapons? Ah, I'm against it. And I believe the present dispensation is an unfair one. Why should some be allowed in terms of international law to have it? while others have it openly, although not being allowed to have it, breaking the international law, while others are attempting to achieve it, like Iraq and Northern Korea, and the world sits still. I think a fair dispensation would be to reach international agreement on the systematic phasing out of nuclear weapons. And for that matter also, chemical weapons. In our next episode, we will return to the constitutional negotiations, the critical four months before the 27th of April elections in South Africa.